sentimental journey there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lindy. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm Brad, and I'm just gonna uh, get started, if that's alright with you guys. Um, I um, I don't normally do PowerPoints for presentations. I have lots of different ways. I find um, I teach. Uh, I, I I've taught here, as what he said since the beginning uh, of Visa. I teach at UVic, uh, and I also teach at Colson College. Um, and I find that to do a PowerPoint for everything can often be a little bit banal and, and gets a little bit redundant and formal. But I decided um, that I would put together uh, a PowerPoint product, uh, presentation for, the, for this talk. Uh, and I thought if I was going to do something uh, more formal, that I should probably it, it house it under some kind of uh, conversation. So I spent a bit of time uh, thinking about um, about how to contextualize my work, because as Wendy said, uh, a lot of people speak about my work as be, uh, about me as a photographer, uh, which is great, because most of my work ends up becoming a photograph in its final uh, state. But I don't, I've never really felt of my of myself as strictly as a photographer, and I think of myself as, as just uh, uh, someone who's interested in uh, looking and experiencing fragments and sort of expanding on on my experience of things. And so um, <clears throat> what I've noticed a, a lot lately in my own practice and as an instructor, and I think these two, um, these two uh, professions or practices complement each other very well, but they also contrast each other uh, in an interesting way. Uh, but one thing that's happening to me in both realms, in both my studio and my classroom uh, practice, is that I, I've recognized uh, something that I think we're all dealing with now in, in the 21st century, now that we're uh, over a decade into it, um, about no uh, notions of originality and, uh, and concepts of, of meaning and how we, uh, how we deal with these things. And um, I, when I was at Concordia University, I studied uh, with some really amazing people in my BFA degree. Uh, Penny Cousineau was teaching there. She's now uh, back at, uh, at, at uh, University of Ottawa. Um, but she, um, she was talking to us about this idea of, in the 1990s, the late 1990s, of post-post and what uh, this um, phrase of, of what happens after postmodernism. And I remember I struggled with that a lot as an undergrad because I was still just trying to deal with what postmodernism was and what modernism was and, and contextualizing all of these uh, shifts and these sort of overlaps and gray areas that existed between them. So if we were going to move on to a whole new uh, ism, that I was going to be informing as a, as a young artist, I thought that's pretty kind of a scary thing. And then I realized probably the only scary thing about it is is thinking too much about it. Um, and that postmodernism uh, has, in a way, freed us up from that. And this idea of what comes after, or in high postmodernism, if, if we want to refer to it as that, is is comes to me in the idea of originality. Um, and I think uh, that the what we consider. The history of the meaning of the word originality has has changed, and it has to be seen as being in flux, like ideas, like conversations. Uh, and so, I decided to frame my conversation uh, as within my own studio practice um, in the idea of originality and, and and how much how important it is to see that as a flexible um, term. And so, uh, that's where I came up with the phrase "everything happens now again," uh, just for us, because. It does, really. Uh, everything's already happened. There's nothing I'm going to show you that you haven't seen something like it or that doesn't remind you of something else. Um, but there's an authenticity in my desire to explore meaning and potential. And so I think even though it may have happened exactly uh, or very similarly to the way it is, it cannot happen exactly the way it did. And so therefore, uh, for us, uh, it's new, which is kind of good. And so I thought I would start off with um, this slide, which I think is a really... Um, for me in my own practice is a kind of a pivotal moment. Um, the history of water in photography, uh, there are a number of photographers who, contemporary well-known photographers uh, with much uh, stronger practices than, than, than my own, uh, who make work that looks just like this uh, or very similar to this. Um, but one of my favorites is, uh, and, and painters and drawers, a long history of representing Water, but one of my favorite uh, artists that did a body of work on the on the Thames in uh, the UK is Ronnie Horn, and she talks about water as this impossible um, thing 
to photograph and that it's an impossible thing to hold because water is always in flux, it's always in a state. And so the idea of water, like the idea of, of meaning or the idea of originality, uh, to me is like the concept of water. We understand it, but it's, it's never tangible. We can't hold it uh, and it's moving before we can even grasp where it's been. And, uh, and so I, I quite like that idea and the potential. This is from a, a series I did um, which we'll talk about a little bit, uh, a little bit later. And so I was also very uh, engaged with this quote uh, that I found of Heidegger's, um, and maybe I'm over-quoting this, uh, I'm taking uh, a citation to a holy level by citing the source and the source uh, of this. Um, but this is, uh, each answer remains in force as an answer, only as long as it is rooted in questioning. Uh, and I think that's, uh, this is Heidegger's uh, quote from Heidegger in the origin of uh, the work of art. And I think that like the ideas and the concepts of the flexibility of, and, the, and the, um, the shifting of water, that, that this is how we need to think of the idea of the answer, the idea of originality. That, that as long as it's rooted in something authentic and something um, uh, driven, then, there, then there's meaning, new meaning to be found from it and a new potential. Um, and I started exploring a lot of this uh, process. I think, um, I think what we do uh, and what we know defines us as, as people. We all know that. Um, but I also think it's, it's very, very informative of, of how we act and how we make work as artists. Um, and this is something postmodernists were, were obviously very interested in. Uh, and so I, I, I'm starting with this body of work that I lamented. I thought, well, maybe... Maybe it's too old, maybe I shouldn't be showing this work. But then I realized every time I try to put a, a talk together, I have to include some of this work um, because it's formed the way I make work. And it's very, very important to me. Um, and I think you'll see how it kind of comes full circle uh, in terms of, of my talk tonight. Um, but what I'm showing you now is a video still uh, from a named June Paik performance. This is named June Paik, um, who's a influ very influential uh, artist from the 1960s, particularly in terms of video art. Um, and he was one of the many artists that this body of work called Artist as Worker, which was my, um, uh, my thesis work for my, uh, my graduate, uh, my undergraduate uh, exhibition uh, at Concordia University in photography. I did a double major in photography and sculpture. Uh, and I find for my own practice, I can't really separate the two. Uh, my photography is very, very performative. It has a lot of sculptural elements. And a lot of my sculptures, which um, there's probably, I don't think there's really any pure sculpture in here. Um, as I said, it, it tends to end up being like photographs, uh, or I end up as, as an object of a photograph, rather. But my sculptures, during my degree, they were like, they were more like a snapshot than any of my photographs were. My photographs were always uh, very laborly made and very much about process. And a lot of my sculptures would just be as simple as throwing a coat on the floor and leaving it there. And it was that notion of trying to um, shift uh, the experience of what we see in a snapshot and, and something we glimpse at and, and what, how a photograph operates and how we think of photography. So this is um, Artist is Financial Broker. Um, and all of these works uh, you'll see from these first examples are uh, the gesture, which was very, very important to me, the performative element of this work, um, references something from uh, an influential an important figure within art history for me, uh, which was again a very postmodern uh, tendency to, to you know, um, reference other works and, and recycle certain ideas and, and incorporate them into my own uh, realm. And so, artist is corporate courier. Uh, you can see obviously the, the relationship to Jeff Walls, the mimic. Um, I don't think it's hard being a young photographer. Well, not that young anymore. It's hard being a middle-aged photographer, um, starting out later in life, uh, thinking of himself as being young. Uh, to work and not talk about Jeff Wall, despite the fact I'd love to. I want to rebel against Jeff Wall's influence, but I can't because it's so, it's so predominant in the way that I think. I actually went to art school because of Jeff Wall's uh, photograph, um, Sudden Gust of Wind, after Harashai, uh, uh, Harash, uh, thank you, I'm stuttering here, um, which of all places I saw in Vogue magazine. And I thought, wow, if I can, if, if, if this is, if this is what, artists can do, and this is what artists in Vancouver can do, and I'm just working on all these drawings sort of silently in my home, maybe there's a place for me, and so I, I kind of, I, I utilize that motivation, and so it was very important for me to, to reference Jeff Wall, but at the same time, all of these um, works uh, are referencing things outside of, of the art context, that these are all professions that I 
could have or have had. And it's not important to me whether or not I did do one thing and didn't do another thing. It's sort of an anecdotal uh, situation at, at this rate. But um, a number of these jobs I actually held while I was in school or before I, I went to school and made up who I was as a person and, and ultimately what I was as an artist. Um, and I like the idea that I could make a body of work that isolated things down to the gesture and down to the performative, but then at the same time could remove some of that dialogue and allow there to be an entry point for someone who knew nothing about that, for the foundry worker to be able to see something and say, no, he'd never wear that, or that shirt's too clean, he obviously doesn't work very hard, or whatever their dialogue would be versus somebody who might see this reference uh, to uh, an art historical moment and think, well, that's not actually how Yanita Air was holding her hands, or this, this work is or isn't like um, these kind of performative uh, uh, works that I was referencing. Um, and so what I did was a huge amount of research. When you talked about my first uh, few, my extended period of time with an empty studio in grad school, that kind of is, is how I was working in an undergrad, that for weeks I was, I was coming to crit class with um, nothing, with receipts uh, and, and little documents of, uh, of, uh, of uh, snapshots of, of the boots that people were wearing when they were working on the bus and the uh, the, sh the shirts that people were wearing when they were doing certain jobs, and all these sort of these these tests of, of what things look like, and my instructors were thinking, what the hell is this guy doing? It's not going to work. And I re remember one of my instructors actually telling me, these photographs are terrible, and I mean, not being able to communicate what the end result was that these were just studies, and that I was I was going to make these other things in the studio. Um, and so with all this shopping and going to the the, the, the thrift store and everything gathering together these outfits, I finally reached a point where um, I had to go into the studio and photograph all these. And so what I did was um, creating my, treating my body like, um, like material. Uh, I grew my hair as long as I could, facial hair and head hair. Uh, it was much easier to grow head hair back then. Um, and then I had all these outfits that I had bought, as many of them as I could, uh, and put out advertisements uh, uh, to my uh, peers in the university to uh, you know, lend me or give me some of their clothes. And whatever else I needed, I went to a uh, theater uh, and film prop house and I rented, which, I, you know, obviously I was a student, so I was trying to avoid that um, to the best of my ability. And I brought all these outfits in, and then I had all of these photographs uh, that were um, these moments that I wanted to reference. And while I was putting on my costumes, I thought of who this character would be if he was to be from one of these moments. And then at that time, I sort of assimilated these gestures. So this is from an Ian Wallace uh, photograph. And I thought um, that the doctor would, would definitely be uh, from an Ian Wallace photograph. Um, the artist is bartender, which was a job I actually had. Um, but I never actually wore my wine crank like that. That's just, that's just pretentious. That was for the sake of the photo. Just so you could believe that I actually had one. You wouldn't believe it was in my back right now. Uh, this was referencing Genevieve Cadieu, who was one of my instructors. And so the idea of isolating everything in the context of the job, uh, the, con the space that these jobs are, are facilitating themselves in, and referencing just these gestures from our history uh, became very, very um, important to me and, and um, are kind of part of the playfulness of my general art practice, I think, uh, with this sort of serious undertone, but this desire to kind of create um, something kind of, um, kind of giggle at, I think, a little bit. Um, from there, I left Concordia and I came to um, Victoria. I grew up on the West Coast and I, I uh, did my diploma at uh, Langara College and then spent four years in Montreal. I came back out West because I missed it a lot um, and I was, I was very happy to um, receive an acceptance into the uh, UVic uh, MFA program. And I got here and I thought for a while and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. So, of course, um, right after you leave the East Coast and you go back to the West Coast, uh, and winter arrives, you want to go back to the East Coast. Uh, so that's what I did. I applied for a travel grant um, and received a production grant through the university uh, to go back to work on a series that I had started um, when I was spending a bit of time in North Bay, Ontario. I woke up one morning, uh, this place I was staying at was right over top of Lake Nipissing. And um, I looked out the window, went to bed, it was snowing. And it was dark, we got there that night, and I'd never been there in the winter. And then the next morning I woke up and the sky was clear, and there were all these tiny little dots out on the lake. And it's quite a huge lake um, from a, for a BC Boys perspective. Um, and so I just got dressed, hiked down, and went to see what these things were. 
And as soon as I saw them, I was just amazed by these, uh, by these makeshift forms. You can see this one is, uh, has particular reference to some of the other work that I have, um, being a trailer home. Um, but most of them look kind of like little sheds, the little shacks and the ice fishing huts. And so I was, really, I was really, really enthralled and interested in this idea. So, of course, I got to grad school, I sat around with an empty studio for a while, read some theory, and then decided I have the perfect situation for my thesis and I'm only a few months into my degree. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be, grad school's gonna be quite easy. So I went to, I went to um, Northern Ontario and I, uh, I, I traveled uh, across Northern Ontario for about two and a half week, weeks and I went to numerous lakes and I took hundreds and hundreds of pictures of, um, of ice huts and they were all kind of sort of for, uh, framed within this, this uh, system and playing with different uh, aspects of framing. I loved how they were just these uh, un, uh, unaccountable uh, architectural moments that whatever material you had, that was fine. If it made it out onto the lake and you could get it out onto the lake and it kept you warm, that's all that was required. There were no forms coming by to check things off to make sure there were safety regulations being met. Uh, and there were just amazing systems where people would uh, would work their their um, ice huts, and there was sort of this sort of blue collar um, way of dealing with recreation. Then I read, and at least that's what I thought when I went out there and to begin with. And then I realized there's this whole um, culture of ice fishing huts. There are there are the handymen who aren't even ice fishing; they're just continually working on their ice huts to make. Them <laughs> and then there are the people who want to have lavish. Uh, recreational leisure and, and warmth and theirs are quite ornate and very beautiful and they're kind of like another room in the house and then they're the ones that are actually ice fishing and are out there to ice fish more than anything and theirs are just round shambled shacks of uh, buckets that are on fire and uh, hot holes everywhere and I was interested in, in how this worked and it seemed very sculptural to me um, so I took all these pictures and I came back and I thought this is absolutely perfect um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my thesis done within a year and then, then you know just get shows at MoMA and I'll be famous and everything will be great. Um, and it was when I returned from the shoot that I saw a, a show by Catherine Opie uh, and she had taken pictures of ice fishing nuts. Oh. Oh, <laughs> just unbelievable. And she was a professor at Yale and I was just a grad student so there's oh, no way, uh, there's no way that I would be able to take ice fishing nuts. And they literally, I felt, and I remember saying this to uh, to my colleagues and my graduate advisor, I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Like, if we bumped into each other and our negatives got spilled out like paperwork, we'd be fighting over who's were whose because they looked the same. I can't have this. This is not original. And so I abandoned a project that I actually quite love. Uh, but it's good that I abandoned it then because I've returned to it as of a number of other artists uh, since I abandoned it. Um, and I started thinking about how these forms worked, and I thought uh, a lot of my ideas are based in, in film, and I, I'm, I'm very interested in film, coming back to the West Coast, uh, ideas of, of film and, and uh, photography seem very important, uh, looking at the Vancouver School of Photography more intently than I had in Montreal, um, and just thinking about the general landscape and the shift in, 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 in what, one, uh, what one's thinking about when they're out West compared to uh, out East. <coughs> And so I decided that maybe something I liked about these, um, these uh, <coughs> ice fishing huts is just how they operate within the nature space and how what happens inside this window and inside this window and inside this window all frame out something which is secondary to any other system of framing that's happening within the picture. And so I thought maybe I can create an experience that's like making a photograph but I could do it in the real, the sculptural object, and that I can make a pl uh, an object where if you stood in a place, you would think you were looking at a photograph of that object. Um, that's where grad school got a lot more difficult for me, because that's sort of an impossibility to think of a three-dimensional object in a two-dimensional experience. Um, but what it, what it did is it really opened my eyes to uh, desire to understand something about this um, multi- uh, Facet practice that I have as a sculptor, photographer, never really wanting to um, to adhere to any one. So what I was doing in the in the beginning was, if you can imagine this as a closed um, as a closed area of the wall, is just making these walls and setting up lots of different systems to to uh, make them work, and they weren't working. Uh, this is probably about the only one that fits that does, and it's in a kind of a very uh, fledgling state. And it was by opening up the wall that I 
needed to uh, deal with uh, this space. And I had built window frames and put photographs of landscapes behind them. That wasn't working. Uh, but this piece I did for a show that an undergrad was curating uh, on Johnson Street, where she got a bunch of store owners to, um, uh, to um, hand over their windows. And so uh, they were all storefront window uh, installations. And so I built this with the intention of, of showing within a, sh a shop on Johnson Street uh, called Still Life. And so the idea of still life uh, was something I was exploring in video, trying to use video as a photograph, uh, within a photographic system. Um, and so I took this uh, one hour video of um, tomato plants uh, under a, uh, a low key light that was off the garage of this uh, ramshackle uh, house that I was living in when I was in grad school. Um, and that was it. So the only thing that moves is the uh, little shift in the um, atmospheric light uh, from the air and the occasional bug that goes by. Uh, otherwise, it was just this static video picture of, of this um, little still light that was showing in the window. I thought it worked all right there, um, but it didn't, didn't quite do what I wanted it to do. Um, this was a piece I did near the end of my degree. I don't know if you guys remember the Ministry of Casual Living in its original um, state. Uh, it's kind of sad that right now it's got no home and it's, it has become its own system of, uh, of uh, traveling windows. Um, but the, the ministry was from here to here uh, in its original state. The, at the hinge edge of the door, the ministry ended, and this is all the uh, Adams grocery store. This was just a wall that you couldn't see in, uh, of an extension of, the, of, the sh of that shop space. Uh, and I remember uh, Steve Nguyen and Dave Gifford, uh, two colleagues of Wendy and, and myself, um, who were in grad school with us, they started the Ministry of Casual Living. And I thought, and they were doing all these shows, and I thought they were very interesting, and I really liked the ideas they were working with. And the great sign they made. And the fantastic <laughs> sign that they made, um, which Stephen and, and David uh, made by hand to look like an, an authentic uh, ministry logo, which I think a lot of people still think is an authentic <laughs> ministry logo. And the ministry um, does have a place right now on um, Pandora, right? Where hunters and gatherers. Oh, perfect. In Fountain Alley, just so you know. That's, that's good, because they need a home, and I'm glad they're downtown. But I thought that this project was, was way more important than its scale. I thought it was too small, because uh, the ministry was just a window gallery. So about five feet in, there's a, a wall, and everything behind that is the living space for them to be able to facilitate having this uh, artist-run center open. So I thought I would give them a new status. And I had all of these walls um, in my studio that I didn't really know what to do with. So um, I just made the ministry bigger and uh, painted, uh, I repainted it so that it was gray all the way across, 18% gray, which is a little photographer's joke. Um, and then inside I had playing a uh, loop of uh, video footage that was just taken from the film, um, oh geez, I can't believe I'm getting this into my own artist stock. Um, where everybody takes absence. Moulin Rouge, thank you. Moulin Rouge, because uh, everything in Moulin Rouge has this blue cast to it, and it all moves very, very quickly. So I obscured the video so you couldn't see it, even if you could get in and look at the television. But what I wanted was that blue light that we see flickering from a domestic space when somebody's watching TV uh, at night. But I wanted to amplify that, and instead of running a filter through it, which I could have done, I just found this great source, uh, which is that film, which is, has this incredible tempo of blue light. And that plays at night to give this sort of sense of, of domesticity referencing the fact that there's someone living inside this space, but it's, yet it's a large gallery. Uh, and then, of course, I had to put some actual art in there because the rest isn't really art. Um, so I put up a photograph, which I thought people would spit on, and they didn't. It's <coughs> um, So uh, from that, I, I thought that I was, starting to I was starting to recognize something about the way these flats were operating. They weren't operating inside, but they were operating outside uh, in a way that really interests me. And that, the experience that I was trying to have people um, feel within a gallery space could only work in the two-dimensional. The gap between edges and framing um, really only happens when one deals with picturing and making pictures. Um, and I think I knew this before I even started, but I, I, it took me, sometimes it takes us a while to acknowledge what we already know. Um, and so I started taking these flats out into the landscape and photographing them. When I first began, I was interested in the romantic notions of what we think about the West Coast and uh, the sort of um, the tourist perspective of, of the beautiful West Coast. Um, and little bits of that, or of, of, of something more uh, critical, started to seep in even as early as this, but um, 
not really at the forefront of my mind. So I photographed these all at golden hour, which is also a, a, generally a, a very cinematic time where the light is low, the shadows are long, uh, and a little bit, uh, can tend to be a little bit softer. And you have this dramatic warm light. Um, and then setting the set up, uh, putting in little bits of, um, of uh, ready to hang art. You know, you can just go to a, a shop like Michael's and, and then just buy the whole kit and caboodle um, for $20. And I was interested in this idea of, much the way I was thinking about the identity and the way we define ourselves by our jobs, I think we also try to represent ourselves through our domestic space. And this is you know, an idea that certainly uh, isn't new to contemporary culture. It spans from even before Victorianism, but really found its roots in the Victorian middle class. And so I was interested in, in how this has progressed. So and then lovely little things happen um, when I'm out there. Do you plan on having the boat there? No, I knew you were going to ask that because you know this anecdote, don't you? Um, <laughs> I can't remember it, to be it's honest. Really, it's really quite silly what happened. This is on Dallas Road, or near Dallas, uh, it's on Dallas Road, off of Dallas Road. Um, I, I, when you have golden hour, you have about uh, 30 to 60 minutes of the light that you want. Uh, and so when you set off late with your flat stacked on top of your um, old Volvo station wagon, um, you start to panic that you're not going to get the light, because the light is the most important thing um, of anything in, in these photographs. And uh, so, as I was dealing with the light, I saw this uh, Coast Guard boat coming across. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be great if I could get it just when it's inside the window frame? So, I'm trying to beat the light, and I'm trying to beat the boat. The boat's actually quite a bit faster than I thought it would be. But I managed to get it all. Rude to anyone who asked me what I was doing, because I didn't have time to talk to them. Um, but Dallas Road's not a place to, to try to make a large work and not have people stop you and talk to you. Um, but what ended up happening is I got this shot off, and then the boat came and stopped right here yeah. for the whole time that I took oh. the work down. So if I had just been more patient, I could have just turned the wall. I, I don't know if they, knew, if they were stopping to see what I was doing or they were trying to help me, but uh, either way, it was kind of this strange little moment. And it's something that kind of runs through the thread of, of all of the works that I've done with these flats. Um, because something always happens that's unexpected and happenstance. I, I, I talked about Jeff Wall being a big influence. I was at a talk of his and, and, and he's very methodic and he plans out things, but of course you can't always plan out for everything. And, and even he acknowledges how beneficial these little uh, moments are in the construct of something that's very, very intentional. Um, even if it's the simple shifting of a gesture that you wanted to gesture one way, and the actor gestures another way, and that gesture makes the picture. And you never would have thought of it until you, you saw it, until it accidentally happened. Um, and that little moments like that constantly <coughs> happen to me for this series. Um, so what ended up happening is, uh, is I, was, uh, uh, I was invited to a show called Interface, New Victoria Open, curated by uh, Linda Sachin, who was the then uh, uh, curator of the Kelowna Art Gallery. And uh, she was uh, asked to select uh, um, artists within Victoria to uh, show at the Art Gallery of Victoria that we made works for this show, um, Interface New Victoria Open. Well, it seemed like I was kind of a shoo-in for that because I had the interface between the domestic and the landscape, and she bought into that idea. Um, and so she asked me to make some works for her show, um, which I was very, very happy to do. So um, what I was interested in is, is leaving this idea of the romantic and the sort of uh, picturesque landscape and becoming more engaged in the affected landscape, what Ed Bertinsky refers to as the affected landscape. And the reality that I know what I'm thinking about in um, the earlier works, but wasn't really uh, necessarily as, as, um, as forward thinking as, as it is in these works. So with this piece, I took it up, Velvet Rose, uh, I took it up to um, Port Redford and photographed it up on a, a piece of property that was purchased by a, um, a, uh, a landowner who was able to uh, uh, circumvent the uh, clear-cut rules because it was private property and he was, a, he was a, a private owner of the property, clear-cut his land and then um, sold the land after he reaped the, the timber rights from the land and ended up making money on the, on the return of the land. And I thought that this was kind of an interesting situation because just up in the corner of this is a B&B &B that celebrates the beauty of the land. And it was um, this kind of strange dynamic that happened. Um, so I threw all this stuff on the roof of my Volvo and drove up the island highway. Uh, to get to Port Renfrew. And uh, at this time, I'm starting to become more, much more engaged with ideas of making sure, uh, you may have noticed the wainscoting and the other uh, piece was sort of bowing, and you could see the, the uh, combination of the, of the walls, the four by eight feet, 
Um, so you can always see the joint and they're just quick clamped together with these clamps. When I started uh, introducing the sandbags and then playing with uh, slightly more um, uh, realistic elements that you know something's plugged in and, and alluding to the space that is uh, referred to as being interior outside of the frame which kind of builds off of what's happening in the exterior of the frame. Um, within all of these works it's really important to me um, to sort of show the condition of what we think of the landscape and the, and our, and the, of the realistic relationship of what the landscape looks like. But it's also important for me to think about all of the things that uh, present uh, a representation of all of the things that happen um, in things like ready to hang art or buying a wall sconce uh, and hanging it upside down so that you can have a more creative uh, interior design experience uh, than those who would hang it upright. Uh, these are all quotes and directions that I'm getting from uh, interior design magazines. Whenever I found myself kind of chuckling at something, I'd post, postmark it and make sure I follow suit with it. Um, little bits like the uh, digital uh, thermometer, uh, which you know, of course, is perfect for me because these are large-scale photographs, 40 by uh, these are 40 by 50 inches, um, and so you can see the details of the numbers on the um, on the digital code, but they're not real. It's not really plugged in. But of course, they have that lovely little um, clear plastic uh, number system to let us know that it works, um, and so uh, I kind of like using those tropes. But then I also really like this sort of strange performative element that happens in these works. Um, not just when I'm putting them up, but when I'm buying the props um, to uh, place in them, because I take them all back. I have a ritual when I make these works uh, that I, I rent a van the night before, or the day, uh, the day before, depending on what I need to do. Um, and then I go shopping for all the material that I've sourced out at, at places like Winners and Michaels and uh, anywhere else has a really open return policy. Um, and I buy all this stuff, and then I take my photographs, and I send my, my, my uh, mix to Vancouver, they process them, and then as soon as the lab technician that I work with uh, calls me and says they all look good, well, then I return everything right away, because it's easier to return it within five or six days rather than 30 days. Um, so after Linda Sachin's, uh, the work that I did for Linda Sachin's, I, I created three works for the uh, Interface Show, I applied for a lab exhibition, which was a really great experience. The AGGB has been um, very supportive for me, uh, and I think it's a really, um, a really great institution uh, for this uh, for this city. And I, and I, I know they struggle with um, being able to present enough, uh, enough contemporary artwork for the contemporary artists, uh, but I think that's a regional problem more than a um, than an institutional problem. Um, and so I, I was lucky to get to show at the lab that helps facilitate that. And, and part of the idea of the lab is that they wanted work that would reference their permanent collection. Uh, and being from the West, uh, living out east and coming back to the West, I was very, very interested, particularly in Victoria, about um, the, um, the history of, of, of Emily Carr and uh, the sort of romanticism that we have now. I mean, we all know uh, how kind of ironic and, and sort of absurd it is, not just that there's a bronze, uh, a monument of her with a monkey on her shoulder, um, because that's how she should be best known, is for her monkey. Um, but how all these things affect our experience of work and art and painting and thinking about um, what is collectible and what is consumable within art. And so um, this piece was all based on a show that uh, was called uh, At Odds, uh, um, Wish You Were Here, At Odds with Emily, which was, you probably noticed that I like to turn phrases uh, a little bit. Um, the idea there is, uh, I'm at odds with Emily, and now Odds and Ants is a, is a, is a, um, is a painting of hers. Uh, and I, I don't wish she was here, but I do wish she was here at the same time, because I think we can all see the uh, possibilities of, of what would happen if that were, were to occur. Uh, but within all the works, I referenced her painting specifically. They became the Ready to Hang art. So I bought a calendar from the Art Gallery of Victoria, and then I bought my Ready to Frame uh, pre-matted uh, uh, frames for like $10 from Michaels. And then I popped uh, my calendar in there, because that's what people do when they want to have a uh, family car in their house. Um, <laughs> then they have good art, and so then they're taken care of. Uh, and then I set up these situations. Uh, so this is Lone Cedar. You can see there's a Lone Cedar here. <laughs> so I'm sort of playing with these ideas. And, and, uh, and a lot of this is really does, um, does explore this notion of uh, a lot of, of very important ideas about framing, but they're also kind of, I, I like to think that they're kind of funny. Um, because that's sort of my nature. Uh, this is Hilltop, Odds and Ends, uh, from 2005. So what I was doing is I was wandering around the chosen area, 
uh, presuming that I could find the uh, contemporary spaces or historical paintings, what the lens look like now. So I'm not saying Osnes was painted here, but I'm saying it's probably painted here, probably painted very close to here. Um, you can see that the, um, as the mountain runs here, you can see it running here. And so the way that these uh, the clear cut stumps work in relation to the um, to the uh, living trees, these uh, the, the the rooftops and the of the made and the being made homes up on Bear Mountain sort of uh, reference that same scenario. And then of course the uh, Pringles cup and the bleached out um, Coke container, uh, Coke cup. These things all. Um, you know, could layer in on themselves in terms of, of uh, possibilities of, of uh, sign and uh, meaning in our relationship with the landscape. And I'm even more aggressively now um, dealing with, uh, with things like this, uh, the armature that holds it up, uh, the ladder that I need to have so that I can get up on that ladder and hang that light because I can't put them on the roof of my car or jam them into the van and have enough of them um, that I, that, and, and have the light mounted. So I have to do a lot of work on site. Um, to build it. Uh, and then this one was probably, in terms of anecdotes, was probably one of my strangest, one of my two strangest moments as a photographer waiting for light. Light's really, really fast when you want it to stay, mm -hmm. and it disappears very quickly. When you want it to come, it's very, very slow. It's kind of, well, I don't know, it's kind of like a relationship maybe. Uh, and so I just sat there on my box, waiting, waiting, and waiting for the light to strike this sconce so that it would look like the sconce was on and I it was a bit of a gamble because it was also going down and I was really happy at how the light uh, worked out um, for this photograph. Uh, meanwhile there were actually people who live right in here who were kind of starting to wonder what I was doing. Um, and I recently had a show I, I recently had a show in Calgary uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the Calgary Art Gallery and uh, on my opening night, uh, somebody, uh, the open, I went there for the opening, somebody came to me and said, I'm from Victoria. I, I think I own a lot where you made that picture. I want you to come to my house. And so it was really great. And I actually never followed her up on that, but I thought it was really wild how that kind of happened. So from the um, Ad uh, uh, Wish You Were Here Add-ons with Emily project, um, I applied for a BCRs Council grant because I was uh, still seeing potential. You can see that um, the physicality of the interior, reference to the interior is starting to, to grow. The sets are starting to get a little bit more uh, raw, but more complex at the same time. And when I applied for the grant, I told them that I was going to insert a figure inside and that I was going to make these things more narrative, as if they weren't narrative enough. Um, and I got the grant, and I thought, oh shit, uh, now I have to do this with people in it. And I was worried that it wouldn't work, uh, and it didn't work. I, I did a couple of, of tests, and that's actually when I uh, started worrying. Because the scale of these at, at four by eight foot panels, when you put someone on inside the set and you place the camera to frame it, the scale of the figure and the scale of the, of the set collapse on one another, sort of like my desire to have the more first three dimensional experiences. So I thought, well, how can I do this? And I, I had a performance work that I wanted to do where I was going to go out and vacuum a field, but I was actually going to plug the vacuum in and just, you know, videotape myself uh, trying to vacuum up this field. And then it, that's when it occurred to me that maybe I could combine these things and uh, have the sets sprawl out into the landscape. And so that's what this work was about, was um, providing this, uh, extending on this sense of, of identity through an absence, and that absence being referred to as a, as a, as a type um, or an identifiable uh, other through um, the uh, elements that are left in the photograph. So you can see that this person's really into natural artwork, um, and that this is going back to winners because there's a price tag still on it, and that they uh, like a certain kind of plants, and little chubby cherubs are always good to have while you're doing your laundry, but I wanted to think about um, how our daily actions sort of affect things and, and where that edge um, exists between domestic and public and, and, and the, the landscape and the interior. Um, and then I threw in another little joke, that's an 18% grey card, uh, um, uh, dark cloth that I use on my 4x5 camera, so that's a little something from the photo piece that um, you look at this and say, that's not, that's not a sweater. Um, <laughs> So from that, uh, I ended up creating uh, two works from that series. Uh, this is probably uh, the most amazing moment in terms of those little unexpected things that happened. Uh, I was um, 
I was having a really hard time finding a painting. I knew uh, with these work, all the works, the, the title of the work comes from the color of the paint. Uh, and in the other cases, I sort of found systems and used, um, and I, I used a, 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 a system that's at Home Depot where you pick a color and then it tells you all the colors that are the colors that will go with it. Um, and that's how you know how to design your house. Um, and so from that, I was sort of picking colors and titles in relation to the landscape and all these, I just walked up to the color, the color chips and started looking for things that reference art and art history. And so this is uh, Impressionist Blue and Open Valley Green. So the title references the, uh, the manufacturer's name for the tape, whether it be a uh, paint, whether it be Bear, Ralph Lauren, uh, what have you. Um, and so this, this, like I said, was just kind of phenomenal. So I was freaking out. I, I couldn't find um, I found these little Japanese figures and this little um, Japanese uh, looking uh, uh, plastic tree uh, blossom that sort of referred to Japanism uh, within Impressionism. And I thought, that's not enough, I need, like, I need the painting, that's, that's, the, that's sort of the, the, one of the key elements of my work. And I couldn't find it, and so as a last ditch attempt, I went to the Winners, which is way over here around the corner, like a small. Um, thinking, oh, they've got to have something, and I'd been there two days before. And then in the clearance bin, I found um, Impressionist Sunrise in a, for like $9. Uh, and it actually had this, uh, this um, mechanical process that it was impasto, it had a physical surface on it. So I thought how great that was, that that happened the morning that I was going to photograph this, and I was paranoid that the manager would drive by while on the highway. <laughs> while I set this up, and he wouldn't let me re return this stuff because he would have seen me shoot photographing it. Um, but he didn't, or if he or she did, they didn't care. Um, and then the way that the light uh, struck um, the trees for the exposure, giving it that sort of impressionistic uh, quality within the window, uh, whereas everything else remained nice and sharp. So, so the trees quite are that happy height there on the foreground? Sorry? The trees are that height there? Yeah, this is, uh, it's, if you come off the highway and you turn up onto, um, Tilton Mall, uh, it's right there, and I actually, the police came and asked me what I was doing there, because people must have the cell phone right and said somebody's building a house on that yeah. <laughs> the park. Um, but there's, 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 a, there's a little, uh, this is up above and then it dips down, and so this is the sort of midpoint of the, of the tall trees and the Tilton mm -hmm. Trails area. Um, and so this was, you can see that I was, going to that vacuum and that system. Um, after that, I've, I've, I've been trying for three consecutive exhibitions, sorry, two consecutive exhibitions to get in the Kafka Contemporary Art Forum of Kitchener and surrounding area in Kitchener Waterloo. I really wanted to be part of that forum, uh, that biannual, and, and of course they rejected me twice, so I just kept beating on the door, and then they, I guess they must have realized I wasn't going to stop, because they gave me a show. Um, and the idea there uh, was, um, was that um, they were working, uh, the theme of the show is veracity. And, and what they like, with the idea of this is that you somehow work the theme of the show into the regional um, systems of Kitchener-Waterloo. Um, and so being up west, uh, I, I did some research and I found uh, an artist that I was quite surprised I didn't know of because I know Emily Carr. And Emily Carr is uh, really in terms of, of the history of painting, uh, no one could be put up against uh, Homer Watson, who was Canada's official first painter, uh, and is in the collection of, of uh, is in the Royal Art Collection, uh, and is, uh, is, is, dog is suggested as being um, probably one of the most key figures in defining uh, Canadian painting and, uh, and Canadian art. Um, and so I was surprised that I grew up and I had a master's degree in visual arts and I had no idea who this person was. Uh, and it seemed to be not just a regional problem, it seemed to be a problem of, about uh, Canadian art within Canada. Uh, and so I got really interested in that. And so I proposed to them that I would do the same kind of project I did with the Emily Carr project, but about Homer Watson. Um, and in lieu of the fact that I wasn't going to get to Kitchener-Waterloo, I was going to follow the systems of veracity like um, is, is typically uh, um, utilized in film. I'm going to make Kitchener-Waterloo look, or Victoria look like Kitchener-Waterloo, the same way they make Vancouver look like Chicago and New York and all those other systems. And so um, they were quite into that idea, and so they uh, commissioned me to make this work. So I made this work in... Um, in Victoria, and you can see that uh, natural history is, was the running theme here, which was perfect for me at Winters. 
because uh, they had these little squirrel door stops and squirrel, I don't know what it's for, uh, cast elements, and then puppy squirrel pines. And then the thinker was there wondering what the hell all these squirrels are doing. Um, I took this Homer Watson image and then I, I, I purchased some images that looked very reminiscent of uh, Homer Watson's paintings and then inserted them in the, uh, this is the corn, the real uh, cornfield in uh, just before Sydney. You can see the trucks on the, on the highway going to Sydney. And I thought that looks just like the pictures I've been seeing of Kitchener Waterloo, despite the fact that I haven't been there. So maybe if things don't work out, I could get a job in film uh, doing their, uh, their scouting, uh, site scouting. So these are works. You can see uh, Rushing Stream was the image uh, that I took here. Uh, they had one stipulation, though, and I was a little apprehensive to this stipulation for the exhibition, is that they wanted uh, we have the Emily Carr house here, they have the Homer Watson house there. The Homer Watson house there is actually really, really quite lovely. There are uh, like six barracks buildings that are uh, part of their art program. His house has a museum, it was his studio that's built in, that shows uh, rotating art. And then there's a permanent collection of his work, which is in what was his living room and his sort of smoking parlor. Uh, and then he had a, uh, a coach house on the back of his property, um, which is also preserved, which is used as a pottery studio. And so it's quite a lovely uh, community uh, situation. Uh, and, but the stipulation was is that I would build a permanent installation for the exhibition, but we all know that how failed that idea was in my early uh, uses. So I was very uh, apprehensive about it. But we, um, we talked about things and, and we came to this uh, resolution, which I think worked out fairly well, um, particularly from, from a photographic end. Uh, I show these works now as photographs. Um, one uh, sits on this wall, and then the other one usually sits on, on the accompanying wall, um, so they sort of have this broken space. But you can see around the property, which is about half an acre, uh, around the Homer Watson's original house, the rest of it is all these upper middle class homes that just spawn around, and it sort of becomes like any other uh, neighborhood. And they've got this sort of uh, strange museum, sort of like, I guess, a little bit like the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria um, in its situation. Uh, but there, what was really interesting to me is right on the property, there was this landscape uh, reference which looked very much like uh, what the landscape looked like in Homer Watson's paintings. And so this work was all uh, assembled over a two-day period, um, which is really nice. And then I had to deal with it because it was going to be up at night. So I used, um, these are uh, solar paneled uh, yard lights, but I hung them up like sconces so they'd actually illuminate at night. Um, but, and then, of course, there's a winners in Kitchener Waterloo. Um, so I was able to get the same, exactly the same doorstop. Um, and then uh, I thought I'd throw a rooster in there. So I put a little paper mache rooster uh, and a little, this little pigeon there. Uh, and so this stayed up um, for a month. And then I commissioned a friend of mine who is a large format photographer and he knew what I was working on to document this the very last day before it was taken down so that um, some of the deterioration and the, and the physical wear on, um, on, the, on the interior would show. So that's why this is covered in uh, all the you know, leaves and stuff. And the clothes are absolutely soaked. And um, some, someone actually thought when they saw this, they asked me if the squirrels uh, were nesting in here. <laughs> and they tell them that those are not squirrels. <laughs> Will winners take the stuff back after a month? No, that was, that was, that was actually, you know what, I probably shouldn't say this. I probably shouldn't say this. Uh, these went back. These three pieces went back, and I believe both the trees, everything else didn't go back. I didn't return it myself, though. Somebody returned it for me. I wasn't there. Um, so after all that, I, I, you can see that I worked on that for quite a long time, and I started, um, I started getting tired because I had uh, I had kids, and I had at the time I, I had my young my young boy who was uh, about four, um, is that right? About four in 2008, and um, he really wanted to work with me, but having him work in my studio was a little bit troublesome with table saws and uh, and, and chop saws not being used um, appropriately. Um, so I decided to go back to straight photography, uh, and I really struggled with. Uh, some of the conventions of going back to street photography because it had been so long since I had just walked up to something and taken a photograph of it and walked away. Um, but that's precisely what we did. My son and I ended up walking around um, and I was very interested in uh, finding some way to get the ice huts back from the dead. 
uh, from my own practice. And so I started photographing these recre these West Coast recreational equivalents of the ice huts. Um, and what happened was as we were wandering through these uh, um, urban and suburban spaces is that I started recognizing we're all interested in, uh, or not all of us, but a number of people are very interested in the curb appeal and the value of uh, the aesthetic of our, of our homes and, and our neighborhoods. And it amazes me that people will have really, really beautiful curb appeals in a motorhome or a trailer home <laughs> stuck on the side. And in most cases, it's not the ones with the character that are the eyesores, it's the giant new motorhomes that can be kind of strangely placed on people's property. Uh, but I was interested in how that was working and how dormant most of these trailer homes were. For example, this is around the corner from my house. It has never moved in the, in the seven years I've lived there. Um, yeah, it's sort of maintained and it's sort of, it's sort of falling apart. And so the, these, kind of, these reminded me a lot of the trailer home, uh, or of the ice huts. And so as I was wandering around, I sort of think, started thinking about this desire for, rec uh, for recreation and becoming uh, one or integrated with the landscape. Um, yet, at the same time, I remember the only time I had ever been camping as an adult in a trailer home, watching while I was doing the dishes, my friend who's actually a firefighter now, he's uh, six foot two, he's about 200 pounds, he's very, very muscular, very attractive apparently as well. Um, <laughs> he was out by the fire while I was inside the motorhome washing the dishes and he was like, freaking out about being in nature by himself oh. as a young man. Which seemed really strange because we weren't really in nature, we were in a trailer park. <laughs> like a, a provincial park ground. But he was still scared and then he came running up and, was, and came in and I was like, are you okay, Jay? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I was like, you, were you scared? He said, yeah, I don't like being up there. <laughs> and so then, while we were one with the nature going camping, we watched the Star Wars trilogy in his trailer. Oh, yeah. And I thought kind of how strange that was and how just, how even when we try to integrate ourselves with nature, how detached we become. Uh, from that experience. And so these fragments of, of natural elements that are off to the side uh, deal with ideas of framing uh, similar to some of the pursuits that I was following with the flats. Uh, but they're all moments, uh, natural elements that exist within domestic space. And I frame them in a way and present them in somewhat awkward compositions um, by defining their, comp they define their composition by removing any sense of the, of, of, um, of, of the man, of, of man-made, man-affected space around them. So what defines the height of this is that right here, where the gray starts, would be a power line. And so that was the, the problem for that. Um, and this, where there's a curve that would have run just off to the right of this. Uh, this, there's a, 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 a building behind here, uh, which is luckily white and thrown into focus, and then photoshopped. Um, this guy is actually, I just started playing hockey, and I took this picture uh, three years ago. And he's on my hockey team, which is really weird. Uh, and so I moved away from, um, there's been an evolution from this project, and I've broken up. I like the diptychs, but I was finding that it was becoming kind of systematic, and, um, and, and was, I was starting to see um, problems with it. So I've moved now to shifting that work um, where elements of uh, the natural uh, still allow themselves to embed themselves in these photographs. Um, and they can exist as their independent photographs, so the series now has combinations of diptychs and singular elements that play out. Uh, and I think that that gives it a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more openness uh, in terms of how it's read. And all the titles, again, sort of like the flats, I take the titles from the painting, and these, I, the title is simply the manufacturer's name for the, um, the trailer home itself. So this is Trillium, which is really great. It sounds so modern. Um, from that uh, series, uh, I was uh, I was still desiring to um, incorporate something of the fig of, of the figure. All all these all these projects I've been working on since uh, my artist is worker have flirted with and alluded to the figure, but there's always been an absence of that figure, uh, and so it was important for me to try to insert that into my work and, and to come back to the figure. Um, and so I took this body of work, which is uh, sort of shows alongside with the trailer home, sort of those moments that are happening if you were actually utilizing the trailer out in the landscape, but then um, not quite giving that celebratory um, or experiential promise that one might get from uh, a Tourism BC uh, version. Um, I was very, very interested in this work uh, with how uh, coming back to the roots and the uh, formal 
and uh, functioning elements of photography itself, of dealing with lights uh, for providing us with information, uh, speed of the shutter, um, uh, so time to define the gesture and how something moves or exists in space, and then of course blackness and that void with which everything uh, is, is, uh, is unknown. And so water to me was a very, very um, natural place to go to. Um, there is a, a history of this kind of work in painting, a lot of painters dealing with the body underwater, uh, basing it from photographs, and I was interested in that, uh, right down to the point that when I was taking uh, the preliminaries of this work on Shawnigan Lake, um, the person who lived next door, the people who had me staying with them, letting me work off their dock, their neighbor came down and said he was a painter, he would love it if I would give him a couple of these negatives so that he could paint from them. And I was interested in, in how that uh, sense of painting over photography and how that uh, hierarchy kind of um, still uh, occupies itself in, um, in our realm today. So uh, they're all untitled and they're all with just the first name of the people who are uh, the figures. But what I was interested in, in how this light, time, and void coalesce is how upon the freezing of these bodies beneath the surface of the water um, feels um, like it is stuck between things. I'm very interested in this idea of in between, of the edge of things, as you probably figured out. Um, and, I'm, and I like how, at the same time as this alludes to um, a, a, a stroke through the water, it can also allude to a body just literally uh, floating from or floating down uh, or submerging down into uh, the depths of the water. Um, and I think that only a photograph can do that, which is probably why so many painters work um, from this practice. And there's something kind of personal to me as well. My, fa my um, grandfather-in-law, who I never met, my wife's um, father, or grandfather rather, had taken pictures um, not like this, but similar to this, of people frolicking off of the docks on a lake in Ontario, which is where we, you know, a lot of people have uh, summer cabins. And he was using those as painting studies. And I was really interested in the photographs. Um, so I'm quite interested in how the time is held and how these bodies are left in this abstracted stasis from uh, the surface of the water. Um, and I refer to these as, um, as being somewhere between a, uh, a dance, a dream, and death itself, which is um, kind of, an, and, and uh, I'm realizing it's a really dominant thread in all of my work, and I think it's obviously just something that's the nature of photography. Um, but within all of these absences, certainly there, there can be this sort of uh, more serious and macabre undertone of, of mortality and, um, and what mortality can pro provide for us both um, before and after its, um, its effect on us. Um, so this is an installation shot of how uh, the work looked at a, a show at the Nanaimo Art Gallery curated by Nicholas Stanbridge. Uh, and then this is from, uh, I just brought in one because they look very similar to the others, but there was a big shift. The um, swimmers originally, I was trying to uh, reduce my uh, costs as an artist. Being a photographer is ridiculously expensive. Um, and making prints the size I was making them was part of what moved me away from, uh, from the flats. Um, the printing and the framing and then the shipping uh, becomes pretty crazy. So the other prints were 20 by uh, 30 inches. Um, and then, uh, uh, and I knew this was going to happen when I printed them 20, 30 inches. They needed to get bigger. Uh, and so this new, those were all shot in, in medium format film. Uh, I've now since uh, this last summer shot a bunch of new images in 4x5 and they'll be printed uh, 50 by 60 uh, 50 by 70 inches. Um, so the detail in them is, is going to be uh, quite a bit more intense. Like even here you can probably see how much more uh, detail you get in the suit. And so I thought because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm putting all these other figures uh, into this stasis, I should maybe consider myself. Um, so this is um, from the new body work, which is other people, but this is myself, this a self-portrait. And then uh, maybe I should pause this here. Um, oops, come on. Did it pause? I'll oh, pause for uh, This is, uh, oops. This is a series of video works. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Do I have like another 10 minutes? Sure. Is that all right? Can you guys handle that? Because I can stop. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've been, I, I, I mentioned how I was interested in um, shifting my practice, and I did a lot of video work in my undergrad um, and 8mm film work. 
so I started thinking about, well, let's just let this play through. Um, talk about more than this. I don't know why I have multiple uh, arrows. Um, I started thinking about uh, video and this idea of nostalgia and recreation. Um, and we have been to the Midway a couple of times at the Sandwich Fair. And I thought how strange it is that our experience of, um, that my experience of the, of, the, of the Midway in the parking lot at uh, this, the mall in, in North Delta and my son's experience of the Midway in the fields at the Sandwich Fair are not actually that much different. The, the, uh, the rides are, are the same. They've sort of lost this, they've become timeless. And yet, and, and in that, there's this sort of strange um, resonance about the way they, um, the way this isn't quite, it seems to be skittering a little bit in the uh, program here. It doesn't skip like that, it just plays straight through. Uh, but what I was interested in was, uh, was this sort of possibility of, of um, memory and loss and meaning and how the frame kind of plays that out. Um, and so this work is uh, one of two video works that explores this notion and it comes from, uh, the subtitle of each work is the name of the ride, so this is the yo-yo. Um, and the series work, uh, as I explore it, is called The Sweet Hereafter. Uh, which also has a, a reference to the cinematic and this really lovely moment in the Adam Goyan film um, where everything is sort of seen in terms of the, the, uh, the good and evil of, of, of basic human existence uh, and there's this lovely scene of just this one little ride playing at the fair, at the fair uh, in the film um, and so I, I, I can't help but think of these as existing sort of the way I, I hope that the, the um, swimmers exist in this sort of state of, of memory and nostalgia that also feels a little bit like you're looking at your own memory um, through somebody else's eyes uh, that has that kind of um, uh, familiarity yet uh, still a strangeness. So this just this I play this for an extended period of time. I loop the uh, figures so they stay up for an impossible ride. They stay up for uh, for uh, two rides before they start to descend back in and then it loops again. Uh, it was also very important for me with this work to, um, uh, oops, sorry, I can't touch my screen and talk at the same time. It was very important for me to um, allow for, uh, this is Hurricane, the other piece uh, from the suite here after, um, to allow for um, a sense of, um, of, of sort of, I just totally lost track of what I was saying by pushing that button. <laughs> I'll stop talking for a second. Just enjoy these silent videos. So there is no sound, no button? There is no sound. No, um, I'm, I'm really, really... Uh, I like being jealous of artists' work. It's what motivates me to make work. When I see artists that do work that I wish I did sooner, or uh, which has shifted from uh, the Kathanopi situation, rather than um, uh, freezing me, they... Mo they, they they motivate me to continue, and I'm a big fan of Mark Lewis's work uh, and his uh, cinematic uh, video works. Um, and so this is sort of a, a bit of a homage to uh, that style of working. Um, Owen Kidd as well, uh, he's uh, represented by Monty Clark, and he, a lot of his video works are very similar to the kinds of things I was well, looking at in my undergrad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so th this piece is sort of the same thing. Um, what I like about the, the multi-window here is at first it appears that we're looking at the same image twice over because it's the same ride uh, and the cars are the same with bro the same broken uh, headlights. Uh, but the guy on the left has a white baseball hat on backwards and the guy on the right has a black baseball hat on backwards. Um, so they're different people, different groups of people but how similar that is. And so again, the sort of repetition of, of the family and this sort of experience of adults and children playing out I think this is probably my favorite part here is when it starts to Whoa. come in and out of the frame. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and so for me, a lot of this is really where uh, photography and video um, meet uh, and, and separate is what I'm kind of exploring in a lot of these video works. Um, and then the last work that I have, is um, is these are these are two uh, windows that I have. The uh, work shows in two different uh, variations. One is that any individual. So this is Pollock, uh, one hour fifty five minutes and fifty five seconds. 
So this would play with five monitors, um, the small flat screen monitors that are sort of like a, about the size of, a, of an iPod, wall mounted. And they all, they're all the same footage that happened over one hour, 55 minutes and 55 seconds, but they all start at varying points in time so that as the exhibition goes, you can see the same event happening simultaneously or you can see how they separate. Um, the other variation of this work uh, is when the work is completed, there will be 21 works uh, where I watch a film and all 20, 21 works will show uh, a single monitor of that, of that action. <laughs> and so I've sped it up because you guys don't want to sit here for an hour and 55 minutes, 55 <laughs> seconds. Um, so it's this weird little loop thing that you're supposed to play at the same time so you can get a sense of how that works. I'll see if I can get this to go. So the idea here is that, um, is that it references back to early photo explorations uh, or video ex explorations where there's the, this, these conceptual performances uh, exploring the experience of looking at and playing to a video camera as well as sort of coming full circle to my artist as worker. So that knowing that I'm filming myself or videotaping myself watching a Hollywood film, eliciting, waiting for the moment when it elicit, elicits an emotional reaction from me, and that's when the film ends. So what, dream may, what dreams may come, I think, is 6 minutes and 59 seconds, or no, 13 minutes and 59 seconds or something ridiculous like that. So that's how quickly that film uh, made me cry. But I've, I'm going through all films about artists and then moving on from there. So I also have um, Basquiat and so on. Um, it's strange, all the artist films are really long until I cry. Because um, they don't wait, they wait till the end before somebody dies. Whereas other Hollywood films, they kill people off really quickly and emotionally um, to um, embed you in the experience. And so what I'm interested in in this work is um, the artificiality of emotional uh, experience and emotional purging. Are you doing real crying or fake crying? Well, that's, that's, that's the thing, is I come from a theater a background in film and theater before I came to visual arts. And um, it's sort of at the interstice between authentic and real. Um, because I'm allowing myself to cry, but I know I'm filming myself for the sole purpose of crying. And I'm renting these films for the sole purpose of making myself cry. In fact, I know I'm going to cry in them before I rent them. Um, <laughs> but I'm interested in that maleness, uh, in that notion of maleness and that uh, the sort of spectacle of that kind of idea of authenticity. Um, Sam Taylor Wood did a really lovely project where she photographed um, uh, iconic male actors while they're crying. And it's sort of the same thing, they're male actors. And so when you see Liam Neeson weeping away or Gary Oldman pouring his guts out in a still photograph, you think about, well, what happened for this, this relationship to occur? And so I'm kind of paying homage to that and also this, this idea that it's okay to cry when you're in a film, but it's probably not okay to cry when you're walking down the street. Um, and yet, one is authentic and one is just allowing oneself to um, be seduced by the, um, the fiction, the artifice, and the artificial. And I like that idea um, because it's really, it's quite important to me. Um, and the spectacle of the whole thing is important. So I start this talk off with, um, with works where uh, you get to laugh at me, uh, and then I finish it with works where you get to laugh at me and I'm just crying, uh, which is good. Um, because I think they're really funny. I think there's something funny about that moment, but I also think there's something authentically inauthentic about the experience that happens there. I'm very interested in in that, um, in flirting with that edge and flirting with that meaning, uh, which comes back to this statement which we started with, everything happens now again just for us. Um, Hadley Maxwell spoke at UVic uh, a few months ago and they talked about uh, the meaning of you, we, I, me and uh, and how uh, simple language fractures and defines things. And I think that we can extend that out to experience in the same way that we think of we and what we actually means in terms of, of language and meaning. Uh, we see the slippage there, and I think that we can see that in terms of, of the original and in terms of, of interactions with ourselves in the world. So mm -hmm. it's kind of where I ended up. How did we start by laughing at you? Well, I thought that the artists as workers were kind of funny, too. Yeah, that's funny because when, when you see that few times at the very beginning, it's almost like you're It looks laughing. like I'm laughing, yeah. And then you left, start laughing and then you realize instantly that, oops, when you're crying, it's, 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 it's a strange thing to you. 
Yeah, uh, well, I think that's why it needs multiplicity, that it needs multiple monitors of the same thing, so that when you, like, at first it just looks like you're watching somebody, and the way it's set up is the camera is, is set up right up above uh, um, my computer monitor, so we're looking at the perspective that we're comfortable with through if you Skype a lot, if you talk to people. Right, yeah. um, that's the vantage point of the um, in-camera um, uh, system in the computer, so I'm trying to get that kind of proximity. So there's more film just on your... No, the, uh, I set the, they're, they're filled with a, a mini DV camera. Um, I tried HDV, resolution. but it's just way so too telling. Has great resolution. Yeah, no, it's just, if the camera is literally set right, the ends ledge is set right on the, on the top of my computer. It's really high tech, this book's <coughs> particular <laughs> attachments to it. I think it's very great. <coughs> yeah. That's nice to say. I'm a coward. <laughs> But it's nice to say. So where has this been shown? Like I didn't quite understand. Like you, you said a different. Like there's there's several um, uh, movies that you watch, and then you, you you put all your faces next to each other in one room. Yeah, it would be uh, in, in a group show. The um, the the like Pollock, for example, as five monitors could work as in a group show. It's just I would they would be on a wall like this, and other work would be here. Um, for the total suite for the Crying Game, which is the name of the collection of all works, mm -hmm. um, and then the last film I do will be the film uh, The Crying Game, um, which uh, that would take up an entire room. It would need its own space. Mm -hmm. So sort of like the Ronnie Horn, uh, You Are the Weather mm -hmm. kind of installation. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's funny because I have a whole like all my movies that I collect are movies that make me cry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's something that, I mean, we... we I don't have any it. other movies other than... Really? Yeah, well, it, like... Uh, you should come over to my studio. Uh, out, of <laughs> Africa, out of Africa is one of those ones, like, I just watch it over and over and over. It drives people nuts. Well, it's funny when I tell people about this project, they're always telling me about, like, oh, you got to see this one, this yeah. one will make you cry. Because, um, I mean, that's what movies do, but I, I'm, I'm interested in that artificiality. The fact that we can we can um, yeah. allow ourselves to connect and emotionally respond to something that we know is completely artificial, mm -hmm. and yet, yet we purge in some way. <laughs> and I'm interested in about, about that. Does the, the idea of sentimentality come into it at all? Like... I think so. I think there's a sentimentality that runs in all of my work um, that's part of that, that's embedded in this, in this system of, the, of nostalgia. I mean, there are a lot of other things that I think about, but that seems to be this one of those things that's an undercurrent. Yeah, um, that's a sense I get. As, as well as also um, almost like putting up a barrier. Not a barrier, but uh, like you were talking about the edge between, you know, what's kind of what's real and what's artificial, like in your photography. Mm -hmm. And also, but even in the, in the filmmaking, it's like, well, this is a film. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I can cry. So there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it does, it deals with that same, uh, not that same, but it's a similar way of, of kind of exploring and and um, and, and uh, digging at this notion of, of what is authentic. I was a strange little boy, though. Philosophically, uh, I, I was constantly obsessed with with ideas of of um, alternate realities, and always asking my mom, like even a bowl of Cheerios, I'd be like, well. How do we know we're not living on a Cheerio? <laughs> and then the Cheerio's on the end of the spoon and some other guy which just like me is about to eat that Cheerio. How do we know that's that's not our like that's not the world? And my, you know, of course my mom was just like, eat your Cheerios. But that, that kind of that, that I'm very interested in the philosophy and in, in, in the possibility of existence and meaning. And so I think sentimentality is embedded in that, in that process of knowing and, and the, kind of acknowledging mortality. Um, and and not being uh, so worried about um, being mortal, but actually the, the potential of what that means, what it means to know it, what it means to be it. Um, and I think kind of, in a way, that's so maybe kind of a Art 21 kind of answer to that question, because um, it's, sort of, it's very surface, but uh, at the same time, I think yeah. it has the possibility of being much deeper without saying. Well, I think that's the sense I get from your work. It seems very surface, in a way, but there's so much more yeah, we'd be here until nine if we talked well, about Well, I was just going to say, I'm going to write a book. Uh, that's actually an interesting question. I'll, um, I'll only say that. I'm thinking about writing a possible book, but I have to talk to Wendy about it first. Whether I allow it or not. Does anyone have any other questions? I have a question about your built, your wall built. 
pieces. <laughs> I actually love like that word. And um, but I was uh, I wanted to know what your thinking was around uh, showing in the photos the the clamps and the the pieces that held the walls up instead of really having it and even the side of the the floor. Yeah, right? that's an interesting question. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Jeff Wall's The Destroyed okay. Room. I often show that when I talk about the walls and then I decided I'm not going to show it this time. I'm going to show Mimic instead. Um, but The Destroyed Room was a really, really influential uh, element uh, to uh, photograph for the decision to make that work and to explore the ideas of that work. Um, and I think, like in that work, it's very, very important and, and uh, integral to the meaning of how it works how it operates within the discourse of representation and the history, and particularly in referencing certain um, histories in photography, to show that artifice, to uh, allow the artifice, uh, the, the system of how it's made and, and how temporary it is to be at the forefront of the work, because otherwise it's exploring <coughs> notions of illusionism that I was calling to question and, so, um, and, and playing with. And so it's sort of like, um, in a sense, it's sort of the opposite of what IKEA is trying to do, but exactly what IKEA does when they set up those little scenarios, right? You know, they, I think there's even commercials now. Robert Amos asked me a really strange question. Um, uh, the only questions ever asked me, actually, um, it was other than how are you? Uh, it was which was quite strange. Which is, well, don't you think that these look like advertisements? And I, and I, I kind of thought yes, and I kind of thought no, because they. They work from that system, from um, but they, they exist completely outside, <coughs> and they they sort of work within um, collapsing some of those those structures. And IKEA has a series of commercials that I saw at Christmas when I was back at my parents' house, uh, where people are sitting in the sets that they make, and then you see the people in the perfect house, and they pan back and they show you come to IKEA. It's just like home, or whatever their catchphrase is. I'm interested in that, in in, ex in working from that. Uh, and when I was, uh, not to belabor that question, but when I was at, in Kitchener buying the materials, when I was walking through Home Depot, they were saying over the loudspeaker, I was there multiple times, so I heard it multiple times, but I think it was about every 15 or 20 minutes, somebody would come over the loudspeaker, this recording would play, um, to come and talk to one of their uh, uh, design specialists, and they would ask you five questions to allow for you to design the home that's perfect for you. And I remember thinking, how absurd is this? And I'm walking through this space, collecting all of these things, and having this commentary kind of thrown in at me, because that's, um, that's sort of, you know, not really possible. Um, but yet desirable. We desire that. I desire that. I don't exist outside of that. I grew up in the suburbs of Vancouver. Uh, it informs a lot of the way I think about space. But Brad, doesn't that, those elements you use, it also talks about the artifice that of Photoshop and photo editing, so that there's no confusion, like there's a real yeah. sense of, you know, everything is there. Yeah. And those remind you, so it's, it's you don't question. Because it would be so easy, yeah. it, would be, it would have been so easy for me to take those failures in the studio and photograph them, light them properly, and then um, blue, blue screen them mm. into the perfect landscape and have them seamless. And if I wanted to, I could build grand, grand tableaus uh, from that. Um, and I think that's where this project kind of ends for me now, is I think the only way I would be interested in continuing to do that work would be to be able to create something grand, on a grand scale that's still temporary, that would still come down at the end of the um, site and be open and be lit by the natural light rather than um, artificial light. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of what, that's what we, how we make a studio, is to control all of the qualities that are existing in the world that we can't control. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't interest you at all to take it completely inside, to fabricate it? Um, no. It kind of goes against what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. No, and I'm interested in... in um, in artists that have done that and, and who are working within that realm, um, but it's not not really for me. No. I feel like it was my nurse because I think it'd be fun to do a project instead of working off the pedals of the home depot paint pillars, working on the ground, interior decorators from the winners, and go through the five questions I said. <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. Uh, a friend of mine, Mackenzie Stroh, uh, did a series of self portraits. Uh, she lives in New York. Uh, she was a grad student at Concordia. She did that with portraits. She would go to makeup, um, to, to the makeup counters, uh, and she would dress a certain way. 
and she would ask them to make her up. And then she would go back to her studio and document her appearance as this, and it's quite strange, like the, the levels of makeup and, and how aesthetically varied she would come back. <laughs> yeah, I think she sort of elicited something from the way she was dressed for them to draw from, and then they would sort of use her as a blank canvas. It's a funny project. I like the Well, thanks, Brian. That was great. Yeah.